appropriate segue. Nice. So Hold we're on. very excited um, that both of you are here. Uh, Scott Goldman is the vice president of the Grammy Foundation and the Music Cares Foundation. So he is the guy on the non who runs the nonprofit side of the Recording Academy, the Grammys. So it's not just a TV show once a year. It's all sorts of advocacy work, musician support services, mm -hmm. and helping musicians expand their careers and their livelihood and was a keynote moderator for us last year, and he did such an amazing job doing the interview that I opened, I offered him the open invitation, anytime you'll come back to New Orleans, we want, no you, pressure. To, <laughs> we want you to do our headline interview. Anya Grumman is the director of NPR Music, and I am a huge fan, and I tracked you down and asked you if you would come to New Orleans to come and talk about how you have built this online platform into what is, in my not so humble opinion, uh, the greatest resource for a fan to explore such an incredible, diverse array of music. So, from and from an artist standpoint, it's amazing because you can reach a smart, curious audience. From a fan standpoint, it's incredible because the 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 doors. Uh, every door leads to a dozen new rabbit holes that you can get lost in for days, as, as I tend to do. Like the mud at Jazz Fest. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> <laughs> With the onesies. I rocked that mud. Sorry. Uh, uh, and <laughs> uh, I can't believe you let them say that uh, on, on your, your, uh, your staid, stodgy uh, channel. You let them do all that cursing on the, on the, inter <laughs> on the internet. Anyway, um, we're so thrilled that both of you are here. I'm going to let you all take it away. Please give a great round of applause to Anya Grumman from NPR Music and Scott Goldman from the Thank you. Academy. Good morning. I realize we're, you know, we're now in uh, the second weekend here of Jazz Fest. I am so pleased to see this many people who are out before noon. Um, we're, we're pleased about that. Anya, welcome to Sync Up. Thank you. Um, I'm going to kind of set the table here just, uh, just a little bit, give you a sense of what it is uh, we want to get into, um, uh, if only, uh, only briefly. You know, we spend a lot of time here at Sync Up, and I'm sure those of you who were here last weekend and those who've seen some of the discussions this morning about what artists and creators might do, uh, what platforms exist out there to monetize what it is you do, to get noticed, to put your content in front of fans. We don't often spend time talking about the architecture, the thinking, and the innovation that goes into the platforms that actually bring your content to fans. And that's what we actually intend to do. It's either that or shadow puppets. I'm not quite sure. Um, uh, if you've recently streamed an NPR music program online, downloaded a podcast, or watched a concert on your iPad, you have Anya to thank. Charged with creating a multi-platform experience, and we'll talk about what goes into that, to encompass and build upon the music programming that most of you already know, that's produced by NPR and its local affiliate stations, she's encouraged both artistic and technological innovation and experimentation. And as a result, while commercial radio has faced all manner of challenges and seen consolidation um, in its audience, NPR music, has become ever more eclectic and innovative, broadening its offerings um, and its audience, where Anya just told me um, this month, 3.5 million unique visitors to NPR Music. So it's a remarkable success story, made even more remarkable by the fact that it was built in five years. So with that, um, uh, I, I, I think we're done. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks very much. Good night. No. Um, for, so first question, a little bit, a little bit about you. How, how does an English major end up at NPR? Lack of other career options. <laughs> <laughs> how did you find your way into, um, well, you started I in always, classical music. Right, I played piano and sang in choirs and things like that. And so always felt a very strong connection to making music. Mm -hmm. um, felt like it, it sort of got me through my teenage years to have an emotional very much an emotional outlet that gave me structure and right. helped me make my way through the world. Um, and then I graduated from college with an English major, but I also played music the whole time. And, um, and, and I moved to Flagstaff, Arizona with 
seven friends. Center of the cultural and universe. And we, no, we had no clue what we were going to be doing. Mm -hmm. And so everybody did different things. And I volunteered at the local public radio station and took some music classes and, and um, ta taught piano lessons. And, but, um, and I started the music library. I started the first um, database, music database, at the public radio station in Flagstaff and was programming music and was on the air, thankfully, only a few, I mean, on Saturday and Sunday nights when only the people in the, uh, in um, the towers where they look at the stars and the hemispheres beyond our own. <laughs> we're listening and, to the radio. And, and appropriate, li an appropriate <laughs> listening audience. But that gave you, that gave you a good sense of, uh, of what it takes to run, a, you know, certainly a local, right. a local station. Well, I think I, the thing that I've been most curious about over time and continue to be most interested in is like, how do we connect people with music? And, mm -hmm. I, and that is, the essential question, yeah, yeah. and beyond whatever platform you're on, you know, is that's essential thing. How do we make connections? How do we make music resonant for people? How do we get people to fall in love with music? Mm -hmm. And and that sort of can carry you through a lot of things if that's your goal. Sure. Um, my goal is not to sell music. My goal and my staff's goal is to connect people with music. Well, l l and let's and talk about there's yeah. a slight you know difference sure. there, and sure. so you do a lot of things to further that goal and you can be you can do a lot of things there's a million things you can do well it, it is it is a lot about curation um, uh, and and you know in, in many respects radio has served as the curator for the masses in you know in a sense for for many years um, uh, but curation takes on a rather special uh, focus at, at NPR music talk you know talk about because there's there's uh, the, um, the 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 amount of genres you cover is remarkable. Um, to surface what is unique in all of those genres is not a simple process. Well, I first want to explain. I I think the ecosystem that I'm working in is very confusing and and can be really annoying for people <laughs> on the outside. <laughs> but it's partially because we are a very it's a it's an incredible matrix. One of the reasons no no one's been able to kill public radio is because we have this incredibly complex ecosystem where there's 400 and something stations out there and they're each independently owned and operated. Um, and so that's one thing to know, you know. WW each also, by the way, producing their own music and programming. Producing and their and own programming. So this is not all music, this is news programs, culture, you know, uh, music. And so each station, WWOZ, um, which is not officially an NPR member, but we love them. Um, uh, w we do love them. W WNO. Um, is, an, uh, is our NPR affiliate here in New Orleans, and um, they're independently owned and operated, I mean, uh, affiliated with university. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, these are just, uh, so these com non-commercial stations that exist all over the country are each doing their thing. And NPR, where I work, at the headquarters, um, distributes national programming for them to take. We can't force them to take it, but most of them take morning edition, all the news stations take morning edition, all things considered, which each have, which are the number two and three most listened to radio programs in the country. Mm. And I'm talking about commercial, in, also talking about commercial radio yeah. too. So those, when we put a music piece on one of those national programs, it's carried on hundreds and hundreds of stations. Right. And, um, and so that can have real power and that audience really loves to buy music. Yeah. Well, let, talk. So, so, so in, in terms of that, there's also diversity of tastes and genres across the entire system. There's also diversity of taste. Every show at NPR has its own producers who love music. I mean, there's music threaded through the entire public radio system. You can hear it in the little new music uh, interstitials between the news uh, in the big news programs. You have, we have entire stations dedicated to music. You have national music programs. You, it, it's basically um, busting up, busting out all over. Mm. And so my job at NPR Music is sort of how can we take this Five years ago, the brand NPR Music did not exist. It was just there's a whole bunch of music stuff happening, um, including you know live broadcasts, uh, festival coverage, interviews, fresh air interviews, you know mm -hmm. all over the place. Sure. How do we make some sense out of this and create a platform on the digital space that can really um, provide a gateway into an incredible music experience? Because when you bring all that stuff together. It's really powerful, and there's a lot of voices and a lot of curation happening and a lot of choices. So I have a staff of about 20, um, and we do um, events, and we, do, and we have people of, across multiple genres mm -hmm. curating music choices, helping the news shows do uh, 
stories and features about music, um, and then working with stations to do special features and coverage of festivals or special videos or um, things to, to really figure out um, how we can be, do really powerful things that will connect with an audience using all of this infrastructure that mm -hmm. we have. But it's not, it, it, it's not just about streaming a radio service. No. That, that is... So the, what, one thing that when we first started five years ago, we thought, okay, this is awesome. We've got this incredible range of music, world music, jazz coverage, classical, you know, AAA, mm -hmm. folk, you know. And there wasn't so much in the sort of more hip hop, you know, we, we were a little more narrow than we are now. But, you know, what if we brought this all together, what would happen? So we bring it all together and we realize that the things that we're doing directly targeted to a digital audience, that for people who are going to experience it on computer screens, on mobile devices, um, watching video, that kind of stuff was doing much better in terms of connecting with an audience on the digital platforms mm -hmm. than just taking a radio piece and putting it online. Uh, a radio piece and putting it online, it lacks photography, it lacks images, it lacks, usually there's no catchy headline. You know, th there's a lot of things that, to make something successful on the web. And so that's what we've been on a journey for the last right. five years, trying to figure out how the heck can we take this um, basis and framework and make something out of it that will be powerful in these new media. And that, that can stretch across new platforms that we haven't even thought of yet. Talk a little bit about the thinking that goes behind, you know, talk, pick an experiment that you guys, that's something that you tried, um, that maybe stuck, maybe it didn't, um, but what the thinking was behind it and why you did it. Um, well, the, our, our most popular thing that we do right now is called First Listens, and that's an album um, released that we feature an album a week before it's released. And right now we curate about um, five of those a week, or mm -hmm. three to five. Um, people are getting pitched all over the place, yeah. but it, it, it's, it's a really powerful thing. And for our audience, loves it, because they get a taste of music, mm -hmm. and then see if they want to buy it, or see if they want to, you know, it creates fans. Um, that was, I think Warner came to us um, about three or four years ago with a Bob Dylan album, Telltale Signs. Right. And mm -hmm. they came to us and they asked us, because there was all this, everybody was worried about piracy and they wanted a safe place to premiere a piece of music um, that wasn't going to be just stolen all over the internet. So, and, and by the way, if you had had that discussion maybe three years prior to that with a record label, they would have said no chance. They, they, right. You know, there was, there but was they were seeing the power of, of the, that. yeah, and they were yeah. seeing the power of what we were able to do. So, so they came to us with that idea and we thought, wow, that, that's interesting. Let's listen to the album. So, um, so then we listened and we were like, okay, yeah, let's do this. Mm -hmm. And so we figured out how to do it. We set it up. And then after that, we haven't looked back from that. So that yeah. was a cool thing where we were just open. I mean, Tiny Desk Concerts, which you saw Macklemore. That, I mean, he, is, he basically took over that place and, you know, it's never been the same since. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he, um, you know, it's funny because we have this venue, the Tiny Desk concert was literally, the story is that Bob and Steven from the staff mm -hmm. were out at, I think, South By, and they saw this artist named Laura Gibson and they couldn't hear her performing because it was too loud and she's a very soft singer. And then she made a joke. They were like, we couldn't hear you. And... Um, and then she says, well, maybe I can come by and play at your desk. <laughs> and, and they were like, okay. <laughs> and so she came by, and then Bob ran around and tried to find a video camera, and then we set it up. But the whole idea is that um, the space itself forces people to do something a little bit different than what they would do in a regular studio session or on the record, because you just can't. Do. You can't bring yeah. your full band in there. It's, you know, it's mostly acoustic, but, you know, we, we don't have that many options. And so my favorite one was this band called Dr. Dog came in one, one time, and they didn't have, they needed drums, but it didn't have any drums. And so he brought this red suitcase in, this hard suitcase from the trunk, and he started playing on that. Well, that's awesome. Wilco came in and played, and they made, he made a little, um, he took, like, that, the wooden part of where you, the computer keyboard sits on, and he made like a little palette, like it was like an artist palette of yeah. little things that made little noises, like little <laughs> drums and little shells and little things. And so to make a, the appropriate level of, you know, sure. sound appropriate for the space, <laughs> for the space. Yeah. Yeah. And it became fantastic. And that was right. fantastic. So what you're getting with these things is somebody slightly having to adjust. And so you're not getting something that wrote that sounds exactly like the album. Mm -hmm. Also, 
Some artists will come in there and just act like, oh, I'm just relaxing because it's like a coffee shop or something. But actually, the musicians like Macklemore um, who come in there and really show what powerful performers yeah. they are, it really stands out. And, and, you know, and it now, really pops. Now, I'm sure you have artists who are actually thinking about that space before, I, you know, before they get there. If I, I, I would, yeah, it actually makes a big difference in a space like that. Yeah. I mean, it's actually easier to make an impression in a space like that than on a huge concert stage when you've got all this you know, infrastructure around mm -hmm. you. So, but it, you can, it's really, if you have charisma and you yeah. have an ability to connect with an audience, it really stands out. Let, let's, in that situation. Let, let's talk a little bit about, the, that's, that's when folks come to you, right. but you guys are now engaged in going out yeah. and, and doing stories and finding, finding great artists and presenting it in unique ways um, on NPR Music. And I think you brought one example, the, the, the George Porter. Uh, um, Gregory Porter? Gregory Porter, sorry, my bad. We, we haven't, do you have that? Do we, do um, have I, that? Basically, what we've decided is that, you know, people on the internet love video, you know, who would have thunk it? Um, <laughs> <laughs> but for a radio organization, sometimes that's a leap. But um, so we've been investing more in, because our audience has been really, video has been just connecting with our audience in a big way. So I want to support that. So we've been trying to investigate what's a really quality way we can support the artist community, can make connections with the audience doing special videos that feel special. And the same idea about that Tiny Desk concert, which it's a, it's a space where it's warm, you feel a connection being made, you feel it's authentic. Um, and something special, yeah. right? And so those are the qualities that we want to figure out on all platforms. How do we make something feel special uh, and meaningful and frame it in a way that it will stick with people? So this, we haven't published this yet. We, we went, um, anybody know about Winter Jazz Fest in New York? Which is an awesome, like crazy two or three day jazz, you know, just sort of, I mean, deep dive into the current jazz scene and like, mm -hmm. All, all in these little clubs, and it's insane, and nobody can go to everything. And, um, and so we went, and we took some of the artists who were performing at Winter Jazz Fest, and we took them to places in New York that had some distinctive qualities. And so we took Gregory Porter to the New York Transit Museum. And this one, we're, we haven't published yet, but I just really was struck. It's really, has a, it just, I think, it, the artist really shines mm -hmm. in this, and we're really, I, I'm happy about this one. Cool. So I just wanted to share it with you. Let's take a look. This is an experiment we're doing. I sing my lion song and brush my mane She would and she could So she pulled my lion's tail and caused me pain She said lions are made for cages just to look at and delight You dare not let them walk around Cause they might just bite Does she know? She does And she dances around my cage And says her name Be good, be good Be good So, so yeah. I, we've been trying these for about a year, field recordings. We started them with a grant I got for classical music, and so we did some in the National Aquarium with Elisa Weilerstein, who's an amazing cellist, and um, we've done the Avett Brothers in their tour bus, and we did the Civil Wars, 
at a, at a vineyard at, outside of the Columbia River Gorge at the Sasquatch Festival. And so we're trying to go around and work. In each case, with this one, we worked with WBGO, mm -hmm. uh, a fantastic jazz station up there. Um, and so what we're trying to do is partner with our stations to create these special things that will last. And this goes, I mean, this goes a, a lot further. Always one song. Yeah, than just, then, then just, you know, curating or finding a great artist. This, this is much more about a partnership, not only with your affiliate stations, but with the artists themselves, because none of this happens without a discussion about kind of the vision for whatever the, the piece might well, be. Well, every single thing that we do and that appears on NPR Music has been done with you know, with the artist and with um, our curators, and uh, everything is source licensed from the record labels. Anything you click on there, we got permission for. Uh, everything from our live, like live video cast from the Village Vanguard, to uh, the opening night at South by Southwest at Stubbs. You know, we work to make that work for everyone, mm -hmm. um, and so that we can actually pull it off because we don't have a huge budget, but we try to b do high quality stuff. Sure. Um, and we want to, and we want to do things that will really resonate on the platforms that we're, they're presented on. So, that's um, so. Like I said, everything is permissioned. Important to know, by the way. Um, so you know, three and a half million unique visitors on the on the just the website on the web platforms. Right. We also have. It's hard. We're having trouble because one of the challenges, and I know that everyone is having this challenge, is that once you're going across multiple platforms, it's hard to it's hard to count everything and compare what everything is. So, okay, so we've got 1.5 to 2 million podcast downloads a month. Okay, is that, how many people is that? I don't know, mm. right? And then we have a, 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 over a million, maybe 1.2 million, million have downloaded our, app, our iPhone and iPad apps. Right. Uh, you know, are, how many of them are, you know? So there, there, there's that, and then we've created streams. So 200,000 starts last week on the All Songs Considered 24-7 stream that we created, and we started a hip-hop channel. So, and then how do you, so, and then when we put a story on the news magazines, we're thinking about doing a first listen interview, maybe on the news magazines in, in correspondence to having it on our site. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, we have, a, how, uh, that's probably five million people hear that on the news magazine, just that one story. Sure. So we're trying to actually figure out how to do the most powerful thing on the right platforms, but then figure out how to talk about it. Well, yeah, well, well <laughs> there, is, there is that. I'm but not I, there yet. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing fine, out. though. Um, but there, there is that, but I hear you just in, just in this e explanation, and then we decided to do this, and then we decided to do this, and then we're doing this. Is there, um, first of all, is, is, is there a ceiling to that, at, you know, at some point? Secondly, um, are you guys the the disruptors at NPR? <laughs> <laughs> we're disruptors, but we're also the entertainers because we have tiny desk concerts and we invite our staff to them. So it's well, always nice. Well, that's how nice. you get to do everything else. Also, what we do is, right from the beginning, I said any story that's on the news programs about music, we are going to love that story. We're going to pay attention to it. We're going to put it on our website. We're going to try to figure out how to put it up there in a good way. So, and at the same time, the rest of the web the news department was having a little more trouble doing universal sort of presentation of all the stuff that was happening mm -hmm. on the radio, on the web, and so I tried to be a friend. Basically, I don't want to go out there telling people what to do. I don't want to tell them. Um, I want them to want to work with us. Yeah. And so that's been my philosophy, and that, and that success gives you a certain amount of leeway to try things and do risk-taking. Mm -hmm. um, and trying to think about things on multiple levels. So we've been, I think NPR Music has been thankfully put in a position where we're encouraged to put ourselves out there. Um, we sort of try before we ask, mm -hmm. and, um, but we do it you know, thoughtfully. Gracefully. <laughs> we try, yeah. but we really wanna, I mean, we're always impatient, yeah. right? Um, somebody, I, was, I was in this business seminar the other day and they were, talking about. In order for change to happen, you need um, dissatisfaction, a vision, and a plan, and process. And mm -hmm. what we have is a lot of dissatisfaction because we yeah. want to do better, and we want to do more, and we want to make it more powerful, and we want to wor work with more special people, and we want to celebrate more kinds of music and art. And we, I see our platform as being able to celebrate the whole 
range of great music that's out there, no matter what the genre. Mm -hmm. And we want to be on all the platforms and make them as powerful as possible. So I'm incredibly happy and dissatisfied. Well, uh, and, <laughs> and I have a vision that we could be doing so much more. And so that's my constant battle to try to figure out how to do that and always push in directions where we see tremendous opportunity. We went, like with jazz, live jazz, we want to do a big initiative where we're presenting live jazz from a club across America every week. Uh, HD video across seven platforms, and then on the Coming radio. Coming to New Orleans soon. Yeah, exactly. So we want to do these amazing things. Um, and, um, and that's my job, is to figure out how we can continue doing that. And by taking risks and showing success, and also doing many things at once, which is, annoys my colleagues at NPR, is like, can't you just tell us one thing that you're going to do? <laughs> but I actually, you need to have a whole, what, what I think is, you set a lot of things in motion. I think a lot of artists feel this way too. You, you have a lot of opportunities in front of you. You try to take advantage of as many of them or get ready to do as many of them as possible. And then when the resources or the opportunity or the right artist comes through the door, we're ready to go yeah. um, so, so with some got, big thing. You've got this remarkable audience. Yes. You guys are doing remarkable work w with artists. How, how much, how often um, does the audience lead you to something new? Feedback that you get? Does it matter? Well, one thing that's really hard for people who came out of radio is that we don't know how to, you know, we haven't been trained, you know, we're not print journalists, but also print journalists have an issue too because the way that they write headlines on newspapers is not the way that headlines work on the, um, on the web. Mm -hmm. You know, I was actually, like even the New York Times, sometimes was using their Twitter feed, they were tweeting their headlines for a while. And the headlines did not con contain the name of the artist because in the newspaper there's a picture of the artist with a you know, caption that says who the artist yeah. is. So the headline is like, fantastic, you know. New record. New record, or whatever, whatever it was. Fantastic artist jump bungee jumps off a bridge. But it doesn't have like the name of the artist in it. Well, I'm like, that is insane, right? Because no one's going to click on that Twitter link because mm -hmm. they don't know who you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So there's like, that's just one example of how you can communicate in the world of digital that, um, where people are choosing what they're going to click on. Yeah. How do you communicate in a way without getting too cheesy or without getting too, you know, um, uh, you know losing your soul? Mm -hmm. How do you find a way to connect with people, even in the written word, in a new way? And that's what everyone's had to try to figure out. And my staff is still continuing to evolve. And also, over time, the more digital natives are growing up and finding new ways to communicate, we have to keep up with mm -hmm. that um, to make things feel and be compelling. Yeah. And yeah. that's not, I, I don't think there's a roadmap for that, really. I think that that's something that we have to be attuned to and trying to actually connect with. And you see from your audience what they, what they enjoy and what they're connecting with, and then you follow that a bit. But you also want to make sure that you're giving them things to explore yeah. that they might not have expected. Yeah, because you said, it, you know, at one point, um, the, the, the job of NPR music is to, you know, kind of weed through everything that's out there and find, you know, find the stuff that's, that's cool and worth investigating. The main way things get on NPR music is because somebody around us loves it mm. or really cares about it or thinks it's a good story. And it's not because we think that this thing is going to be number one on the charts or anything like yeah. that. It's mostly about how, if we can love it in some way and we can sort of, sort of put it out there in a way that, we'll, that we think will connect. Um, I mean, Bob Boylan does All Songs Considered, Bob and Rob, and they do All Songs Considered. It's our most popular thing. One of the most popular things is their podcast every week and their show. And that show, I think, that has been going on for 10 years. It was the first sort of digital music show that had actual full tracks, because Bob just worked with the record labels and got those and premiered mm -hmm. new music and all that. And um, so we're sort of built on the backbone of that to some degree. Yeah. And, but that show is all about, I mean, Bob, just has an incre Bob has an incredible sense of wanting to share, like almost to the degree where I get worried because we're going to get in trouble of the, all the things that he wants to share. <laughs> but, um, but that is the essential qualities I've come to discover of what connects us with the audience is that desire to share something that you love. Um, and people connect with that. That's what the back, you know, your, back, your neighbor tells you they love something and you're more likely to check it out. You go to the record store, the guy at the record store has been weeding through all this, these records and you're bound to believe them when they say here's a really great thing. And that's sort of what we're 
out to do is be that person who's at the record store helping you weed through because we're getting hundreds, thousands of rec uh, CDs a week and digital files and you should see the bins. They actually had to create special bins for our department because we're getting so much stuff <laughs> and we have people like interns like opening the packages but um, people just are re literally listening to uh, the, the music and trying to find things that really connect. Who, who is, who's your competition? Do, do you even worry about who's out there as a platform? A lot of people are doing first listens now, and a lot of people are doing versions of Tiny Desk Concerts, and sort of, I, th I think, sort of have seen what we've done and sort of are riffing off some of the things that we've done. And so the things that I think the most about is how can we create, continue to create new things that people will connect with and will feel are valuable, because I'm never gonna win on the resources angle. I'm never going to win because I've got the most money. Yeah. By the I'm way, you, you, you told me that your, your whole video department is you know, just watching people. that piece. Two people. Two people and an intern. So um, um, we'll, we'll hire freelancers to expand when we do mm -hmm. festival coverage and things like that. But, um, so I'm never going to win on resources. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things I'm not going to win on. Uh, we have no marketing budget. You know, not, nothing. So what are we going to win on? Continuing to find new ways. Mm to connect and new platform and new ways to make something feel special. And that's all we've got. Yeah. And so <laughs> yeah. um, and so that's what we gotta do. More and more people are doing a lot of the things that we're doing and I wanna make sure that we still have the ability to get the access and present to our audience in the most powerful way the greatest stuff that's coming out um, and building great relationships with the artists and learning about new stuff. So um, I, I get worried that somebody's gonna have a huge amount of money and just you know. Do, do your thing, but with <laughs> lots more money. <laughs> but I don't know. You know, we have this crazy, as I told you at the beginning, we have a crazy ecosystem where it's coming. There's all this stuff coming from all over, and everybody in the public radio system, there are so many people who love music, who play music, and they're feeding it into all these different mm -hmm. outlets. So it's like something that's hard to replicate in terms of the amount of energy that's going into it from all these different places. Right. So it, we are the sum product. I mean, I get a lot of credit just because of where I'm sitting right now, but it's this thing that we've created, NPR Music, mm -hmm. is the sum product of the public radio system, the, yeah. those 400 stations, those incredible national news magazines, Fresh Air, you know, all those, that programming mm -hmm. that we've sort of created a frame around presenting in the digital space, but it's not only my team, and I think we would, we would be weaker for it, yeah. right? Because every time I think there might be some, I have some holes on my team in terms of their expertise, well, there's a station over there who's like the folk music That's experts doing it. for public, yeah. who's doing it, and then we're working with them, and then they do our end of the year. When we mm -hmm. do our end of the year coverage, mm -hmm. they'll do the best one, you know, 50 folk songs of the year or whatever. Yeah. And my staff doesn't have to worry about it because I've got that expert out there. Do, do, you keep, do, you, do you keep a good eye on a, a survey of what's going on amongst the NPR affiliates in, term, you know, in terms of music and having a good sense for maybe there's a music director well, literally in Omaha who's just got We started just um, practicing with specialty music stream just for that purpose is like let's find these incredible curators from across the system who aren't getting a lot of credit or it's this woman in New Mexico who's doing a gospel show in the mornings in New Mexico and so we got her to do an you know a gospel stream for a while we're thinking so and the purpose of this is every month we're going and finding somebody else so that right. we can actually tease out the talent yeah. that's actually there and I also want to bring new people into the fold like Ali Shaheed Mohammed is doing a podcast, a, mm -hmm. a hip hop stream and mm -hmm. podcast with one of my staff members, yeah. Franny. So uh, like, how can we provide a gateway for more people to have voices, more genres, right. and then to find the experts that are which, hiding in plain sight? Which, which is actually you know, an important point for, for those folks in the room here, because you know, a lot of people, I'm sure at some point, would be asking Anya, well, how do I, you know, how, how do I get my music heard by someone at NPR Music? Well, it's not just about the 20 people on the staff in Washington, D.C., there is a network of NPR affiliates all over with music directors and program directors who are also involved in curating and finding great music. Well, so, you know, the Macklemore, I just want to tell you a backstory yeah. on that, is that we went with our station KEXP in Seattle, and we went out there. We did a six-city um, NPR Music Listening Club tour. And it was just basically, we had, pe we had people listening and rating and talking about music, like in, in uh, little clubs. Um, we gave everybody flashcards with numbers one through 10 on them and they would rate the music. And um, uh, Bob Boylan was out there with um, Kevin Cole, who's one of the great DJs in public radio out of K KXP. And he 
told him about Macklemore, or we saw, and yeah. so he fell in love with him out there because out there, he was yeah. hanging out with the station. So that, that curation literally comes from the local station and then spreads like a virus, yeah. it can. Yeah. Um, and what we do now is we're providing more and more ways for our stations, like we're working with about 10 stations that are creating video sessions. Um, and so f f four or five times a week, we're putting up a video station curated by a station, station mm -hmm. across the country so that we can get taste. So KCRW, WFUV in New York, WXPN, KUT in Austin, uh, in Twin Cities, the current KEXP, um, others, um, jazz, classical yeah. also, so that we can be finding, they can be sending us stuff, they can be sourcing stuff in their local communities, and then we can present it to the national audience on our platform. Mm -hmm. Well, talk for a minute, we uh, spend a lot of time here and at other conferences talking about artists building their brand. Um, you guys have had to build, build a brand within an already well-known brand of, uh, of NPR. Um, not a simple thing to do. Talk a little bit about how you've uh, built the brand and attempted to differentiate NPR music from NPR. Well, it was kind of a brand waiting to happen because, like I said, one of the first, you know, public radio was created uh, 1970s, 71. Um, from the very beginning, some of the first things that were done were music broadcasts. So for the last... 40 years, there's been music th threaded through everything. As I said before, it's everywhere. But no one had used that brand, NPR Music. So a lot of people associated with public radio with music, but there wasn't that brand. So in some ways, we just took one that was waiting to happen yeah. and put it on there. Now, the other thing is that we are also feel like NPR Music is a brand that we want to be about innovation. And we want to be about technologically innovative. And we want to be expo exploring, and we want to be broad and an a big tent for music, and we also want to be um, connecting with younger audiences than the core brand. And so we've done things where people are like, what the hell is that? Why are you doing that? And they'll be like, just look the other way. Right. But, <laughs> but, but they've, that's, to, the, to NPR's credit, they've, they've gone with it. it. Yeah. They've gone with it, and we're doing some things that we never would have thought. I mean, hip-hop mm -hmm. is actually very challenging for NPR. Mm. And I'm really happy that we're doing it, and we have people who deeply care about it and feel like it should be represented and as part of our cultural conversation and that public radio has actually done a disservice to it. And part of it is around language issues for the radio side because of FCC sure. and also, um, but, but so we're trying to make a difference in that. Yeah. We're trying to do that and, and actually the, the news programs have been receptive and we're doing a, a lot more coverage now mm -hmm. than we did before mm -hmm. um, because of the trust that we've built within NPR. Um, I didn't tell people uh, when we started NPR Music like, I'm the queen of music, and now every music story has to go through me, and we're going to veto this stuff. And No, but I wanted them to feel like we are supportive and we are a resource. And I think we, we have become a much stronger resource because we're showing the success and we're yeah. showing this audience connection. And now there's quite a few stories that you'll hear on those national news programs that are actually generated from digital first content. So now the stories are flowing from our division up to the news magazines and they can go both ways, and mm -hmm. we're collaborating on a lot more. Right. So, um, and I think that's the most powerful thing we can do is when you can use every platform at your disposal and do the most powerful thing on each one of those and be coordinated about it, yeah. that's incredible. Mm. Now, it's not easy in this world where everybody is owning their own thing and there's a million different people, and getting that coordinated is, is, a, is a challenge. But when people see the value of that, I think that that is amazing. Um, by the way, uh, if folks have questions, feel free to step up to the mic. We'll, we'll, get, we'll get there in, uh, in just one second. Um, I'm not, Scott, how are we doing on time? Just so I know what I'm, 10 minutes, awesome. Um, so talk a little bit about going forward and, and, and um, if you had a crystal ball, where, where NPR music might be in three years, five years, where, where would you want it to be? Um, I, I want to keep being, I want to keep moving. I want us to keep finding more powerful ways to do what we do and connect with more audiences and to connect more powerfully and mm -hmm. to broaden the scope of mu music covered and whatever means necessary, I want to be doing that. And, um, and so I know that's really vague and may sound lame, but that's actually <laughs> what we want to be doing. And I'm, right now I'm working very hard on creating better, more powerful platforms to, uh, for us to do our work. Mm -hmm. 
um, and maybe creating partnerships so that we can um, be out there more. Yeah. Um, and so I want I want us to be, I think, more powerfully connected mm -hmm. to as many to more people, mm -hmm. um, building those bridges and building the technology foundation for that success. And you so it's both a content thing. Yeah, it's like broadening the content, continuing to get better at telling the stories, um, creating. You know, I mean. We, I want to expand what we're doing here. I love it. I love that sure. Gregory Porter thing. It made you know. I just didn't want to turn it off. Yeah. You know that kind of stuff. I want us to be doing more of that. Yeah. And so enabling that to grow, our technology to grow, keep innovating. Mm -hmm. um, I feel good when you know we're in motion and taking advantage of opportunities and growing. And yeah. I want to continue to do that. Yeah. I'm not trying to hedge your question. That's okay. It's hard to know in three years yeah, yeah. exactly. Understood. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and resources are a big part of Resor that. If I, yes. Uh, it's all dependent. Like the minute right. we get resources, then we can spread. Right. And grow. But the, cha the challenge you face, and, and we can we can go into this a little bit. Um, you know, every one of those NPR affiliates is also chasing yes. the dollar. Right. Yeah. So, um, yes, sir, your question. Is this on? Uh, I'm Dan Storper, the uh, founder of Putamayo, and oh, fantastic! Uh, nice I've to got meet music you. Music discovery genius over there. Well, thank you. Um, <laughs> but I, I think one of the things that's been really interesting for me is because there are so many great artists all over the world, and it's a kind of ocean of music and connecting the dots, I think for not even people who are artists, but even Putumayo, just how you kind of reach people at the NPR universe in a way that wouldn't be overwhelming to them if an artist has new music, if it's a new Putumayo collection. I mean, there's NPR music, there's all the shows. I mean, is there some kind of guidebook that people can get to as to who you pitch it's for what? It's 100 pages how? long. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you just got to get to know, I mean, for world music, for, for, for instance, there's PRI's show The World does that daily hit, yeah. which is a daily feature, and Marco Warman just sure. bringing is all over that it's world music stuff, right? Um, so that's a good place to go for that to get national coverage. Um, but even the for story. the New Orleans world, or, you know, because a lot of right. these guys are always But it's sort of yeah. getting to know what the outlets do. You know, I have a world music person who uh, uh, curates world music for us on my staff, but then there's also, um, you know, Afropop, and then there's um, Tom Schnabel on KCRW, and so there's those outlets that we have for every genre where there's a bastion of excellence and, or curation and people really caring, and um, we have Latin, also Latin alternative music, bastions in public radio across, um, maybe I should do something. It's, it is a little, I, we, ha, we don't really have a guidebook, and, yeah. I, and I know that we're confusing and annoying um, in that way. Um, I, I knew this it, would come up. I knew. I, know. I had dinner once with, you know, um, I think it was Elizabeth Barrett and Tom Cole in DC, and, you know, yeah. we were talking, I was trying to ask them, and I was like, you know, and it's always a changing landscape, and I thought it might be helpful not to overwhelm the people, but to figure out some simple way to kind of put together a little bit of a, because I think a lot of music, great music, is missing its way to the people. Yes, you'll happen upon it. It's like going to Jazz Fest and going to a few stages, but it would be great if there were some way, you know, to, other than I can, through We can work promotion. on it. I mean, it's like there's only so many hours in a day, but it seems like a, it, it seems like yeah. a, lot, a question a lot of people have. Right. I kind of also, um, I kind of like the fact that public radio is so porous and that there's many ways to get in. And I certainly would not want to create a situation, and which is why I'm a little hesitant. Yeah. I don't want to create a situation where the porousness is shut down. Because I think one of the strengths is that it, you can get in many ways. And it's not dependent on one curator. Because if this one yeah. hates it, somebody else might like it. And actually, things have happened that way. Like Bob on my side might hate something, but you know, Tom. I mean, or like Tom Cole so, might yeah, love something sure. and we have another way to get it in. Yeah. So I don't want to create like, these are the rules for how to get it in because then all of a sudden you're creating a more finite way to actually get things in. Yep. Um, I know that's paradoxical, but. <laughs> I hear you. Thank you. <laughs> sure. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hi, Elton Foster with Group Rodeo Management. Um, Anya, it, it sounds like uh, you're in, in a unique position where you have affiliates all over the country in almost every town and every city that uh, can feed you all sorts of wonderful stuff. And uh, that puts you, uh, at least in my book, at the very pinnacle of somebody who can, can really uh, find just about anything that's out there. That's coming from your direction. Um, like any major festival or, or any high profile artist, I'm sure there are gatekeepers all throughout the whole system. A gatekeeper in a small town in New Mexico 
uh, for the NPR affiliate, maybe a lot, uh, keeping a much smaller or a, a easier to open gate than in a city like right. New Orleans or certainly New York City. So could you explain a little bit, I mean, the, this is a room full of artists. I'm sure um, some of them might be knocking on the doors of uh, WWNO on Monday uh, saying, here's my music, just from hearing you, you speak. Can you, can you talk a little bit more about the gatekeeping process uh, from one affiliate to the other, or certainly with respect to the affiliate here in New Orleans? How many different kinds of cats are there? <laughs> wow, uh, gee, I'm a dog guy myself, so. <laughs> I know there's lots of different dogs. Um, there's something, that, when you're listening, there, just add some clues to how, when you're listening to your stations across the country or wherever you're from, um, there's certain programming that's created na from national programs, and then there's certain programming that's created locally. And so it's good to be able to listen and try to figure out um, where that's coming from, because in some cases a station is mostly only doing national programming that they're sort of buying from the n different networks. NPR is not the only public radio network that actually distributes programming. So a station that has its own specialty music programs that are done locally are much more likely to have a gateway in to presenting music um, than a station that is taking national programming only and doesn't have any specialty programs. Um, so I think WWNO has music from the inside out, um, which is, that's a locally produced program. Um, and Obviously they're here today. <laughs> and, uh, and so that's one way in terms of getting onto, uh, you know, and, and we've had her create a stream on NPR Music actually um, we tried that so that she curated a New Orleans sound feeling stream and she interviewed artists and we put that in and we may continue that at some point. So that's a way where you can sense that that's a locally produced program valuing the local artist community and that would be a gateway in. Um, and then if you see here the national programs like World Cafe, um, that's nationally produced out of WXPN in Philadelphia. So if you want to get on that one, you have to send your stuff to WXPN in Philadelphia, to but World Cafe, right? So it's about sensing, because I can't tell you, there's 400 different stations in each one. Sure controls their universe. So, um, but hearing that difference and then hearing where that might come from tells you where to send the material. So you need to be a good listener as, yeah. as well as a I good creator. So. so all the different programs of which there are many. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. Yeah. Um, I believe you were next, please. Um, as somebody who's trying to figure out how to do my own strategic plan at this moment, I listen to you and you seem very reactive to new opportunities or new platforms or new artists, new something. Like, how do you balance, and I would love to see that strategic plan for NPR music, actually, but how do you balance having a real plan five years, ten years, whatever, and being able to be flexible enough to take advantage of doors that open for you? I mean, I have the rudiments of a plan and the <laughs> investments that would be required to do certain things. And in the meantime, while I'm working on trying to get the investments to make the next strategic investment in technology mm -hmm. um, and the ability to do curation across more genres or in, in improvement in our ability to do storytelling and videography, right? Um, so I have those plans in place and want to set those in motion. But w in the meantime, we, you have to leave a certain percentage of your operations open so that you can do new things. Um, one thing that I do that I think has been very helpful is I try to create, um, I try to do innovation within a framework. So this field recording thing that you saw, we had a concept that we wanted to do something like the tiny desk, but we wanted to do out in the world. Um, in order to make it doable and to make people be able to picture it, then we said, okay, why don't we call it field recordings? And then why don't we say it's going to be out, it's going to be one song. And so we created a framework and then let's play with it. And the first one we did was actually with a violinist called Gil Shaham at the Hirshhorn Museum in Washington. And we thought it was going to be more of a meetup thing where we tweeted, we had the local radio station announce that we're doing this surprise pop-up concert. And we had a whole audience come and people came because of Facebook, because of newsletters. And we filled a very small space very quickly uh, within a few hours. Um, 
by doing this. And then we did the video, and Gil Shaham had never done anything like this, a pop-up concert. This guy is booked three years in advance. <laughs> so he just agreed to do this. It was the day of his concert with the National Symphony. And we had everybody coming, and it was amazing, and, and people loved it, and they loved him, and he did it for 20 minutes. Um, and as an event, it was fantastic. Um, the audience loved it. As a video, <laughs> it was kind of lame. It, was, it, it didn't have that connection. It didn't have that warmth. It, didn't, it was just like another video of somebody performing live. Mm -hmm. And so it didn't reflect the sensibility of the event. And so we're like, OK, well, we've got this building. We tried that. We may try it one more time. We kind of did it. And we're like, you know what? We're going to reframe that. So we're just going to keep. This is our aspiration, is to get really good at presenting artists out in the world, doing something special and feeling special. And then you can, and then we, and then we said, okay, these are kind of a lot of work, each one of these, what if we tried to do a bunch at once? So we went to went KEXP, we went to Sasquatch, and we said, let's do eight at a festival. Let's just share, instead of doing live broadcasting from the festival, which we'd always done, we said, okay, we're gonna move our resources from doing a live broadcast, and we're gonna focus on doing eight special moments with musicians in special, beautiful things that we think will last a long time. That's awesome. And, um, and so it's, this is the framework in which we're innovating and moving. Mm -hmm. And so we put some resources towards it and, and are constantly asking these questions. And so same thing with the field, field recordings or, uh, I'm sorry, the first listens or the tiny desks or even our lists or you'll see us changing things over time. Yeah, that's Because we're doing investigations into how we can be most effective or our live concert broadcasts. Um, so. So that gives us a way not to feel completely overwhelmed, yeah. but to actually be moving in a direction and, and then reacting and um, being in motion. Was Greg Porter's audio also recorded live? Yes. That sounded great. What our goal with that was also, we, have, we use one microphone mm -hmm. for our field recordings and our Tiny Desk concerts. I can't believe it sounded that good. We have an awesome audio engineer yeah. who's doing that. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Micheline Malosh. I'm a business writer who happens to love world-class eclectic music. And there's a genre of music, I love radio too, uh, bumper music. You know, the bumper music that's We call selected. those our buttons. The buttons. And there's a whole thing about that. And I've discovered a lot of cool music. So tell me your relationship with the different programming and bumper music. The, the buttons. This is, this is one of the awesome things is that this is where all the different sensibilities of all the great people who love music get to filter in through the music world of public radio. So, and I also love the buttons because they're like buttons literally have a structural, they can look good and snazzy and they also have a structural purpose of making sure that you can close your jacket. Um, so the news programs, they have you know, segments that are like 10 minutes and then 10 minutes or whatever. They have to hit exact seconds on the clock you know, in order to get all the report, if you're going to get three stories in a 10-minute block or two stories in a 10-minute block and end up at exactly the right second so that the local affiliate can say, you're listening to, you know, WWN. Um, there's a problem because reporters are not reliable on how long their things are going to be. <laughs> And editors have to go in there, and they have, and so you, the direct, so the directors of the news programs, their job is to make sure this stuff comes in on time, and so they use those buttons. They call them zippers and buttons. Zippers and buttons. To basically make up for the time that either they have to stretch or tighten or whatever, and and also, so there, there's that purpose. It's like really functional purpose to get there and get there at the right time, and. Um, the other thing that they're used for is to change mood. Um, because sometimes you'll have a really sad story and then you'll have another story that's a different topic and so you can get a three second hit of something or a 20 second hit of something and it'll change. Yeah, flips it. Flips it. Right. Um, I, I think one of the reasons, and then there's also, they're used for breaks so that when, when we go to a station break, uh, there'll be a minute and so the, they'll put music in there and some stations use the minute to talk over and some stations don't. So. But it, that's a structural purpose. Yeah. But one of the things that I've noticed over time is that also storytelling, like music can really be supported by storytelling, which is one of the reasons so many people buy music when they hear a story about it on one of our news programs, because there's music woven in, mm -hmm. and it can create an emotional resonance. Um, and so a lot of times people will be hearing a story about someone in New Orleans or you know, in Africa. And 
they'll be taken to a place and then the music will come in and it'll support that emotional space and someone will feel really connected both to the fact that there was a story about a person I didn't know about and I now care about from another part of the world. And then I have this music that represents that feeling that I have and is connecting me to that. And that is the minute when somebody is going to Amazon and saying, I want that yeah. music. And that is why those buttons and that music in those news programs are so powerful. And they're done by the craftsmen who are doing the directing of those shows. And not all of them have a music background, but they have a sense for the emotional, the pacing, the feeling that they want people to have. Um, and that it, it does sort of underscore the fact that storytelling and music are incredibly, are both sort of two sides of the same coin. Very much linked, yeah. Um, music is storytelling. And, and, and there is a way, right. there is a way to find out you know what? You know yes. who the um, the content of the of, of the buttons because sometimes literally it's three seconds, um, right. and you can tell how you know how there, cool everyone, a listener you everyone are. Everyone logs know. those. Those yeah. the, the directors are supposed to log them yeah. and they appear on the website under the right. show program rundown so you can right. find them. Um, we've sometimes thought um, a friend of mine keeps wanting me to create a stream of all the buttons that were used, you know, <laughs> in the last week or something. I want to be get, very eclectic. <laughs> I want to get to uh, last question here. Hi, my name's John Alphone. I am a writer and video producer. My company's Corsair Media Productions. So I've been listening to all this chat about um, video, and I live in a state where there's an abundance, a wealth of indigenous music. So what would be the way to get these videos made, similar to the one you showed before? Would it be best to go find a corporate sponsor and then work with the musicians, and then approach a WWZ, W. Well, I, I mean, each, we're working with our stations to bring in wonderful video. We, we, do, we do first watches of videos that were created by the artists that are the commercial releases. Um, so we have something like that where you, we'll, we'll present videos that are done for commercial purposes yeah. and we'll just pay, cherry yeah. pick some good ones. Sure. But a lot of our emphasis is on creating original um, moments with artists and, um, and we work with our stations on doing that and um, so that's one way. I don't, one of the things in my dream list and my strategic plan is a way to be able to um, bring in many more sources of voices and video uh, producers and have a way for them to publish to our platform or for us to curate that and to have more partners in being able to publish to the platform. But right now, everything we do on NPR Music is very hand-stitched. Um, so it's not that easy. And I, I wanna actually create um, a way for people to submit digital first content. NPR has a whole division with a VP that does radio program distribution. We don't, right now don't have any way, except for with our, the way that we've crafted hand-stitched with our partner stations to actually bring in and distribute digital content like video or special streams or special editorial um, for the digital platform or special programs um, that aren't, aren't radio based. So that's one of the things that I'm really working on internally is how can we create a way for more of the great work that's happening out there and for more people to actually be able to be presented on our platforms. And right now it's a limitation because I, don't, I have no way to make that really easy. But Thank that's you. one of my goals. Um, and uh, given the, uh, the, the time limitations, yeah. um, thank you so much for, for taking the time to thank join you. us at Sync Up. Um, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Anya Grunman. Thank you. And we look forward to more from NPR Music. Thank you, thank you all. Anya Grunman and Scott Goldman, everybody. Great. Thank you so much. Okay, well, look at the time. Oh, well. <laughs> thank you, Anya. That was wonderful. So thank you all for coming. I hope uh, the admission price was not too high. Just a little bit of lost sleep. Uh, but thank you all. So that concludes this year's edition of the Sync Up Conference. We will see you all back here next year. Thank you all so much. Bye-bye.